Hello and welcome to Middle East Matters here on France 24. I'm Tom Burgess Watson. Coming up in the program, an act of pure evil, so says the US president, of the latest gruesome video to be released by the Islamic State organization. And lost at sea, we have the story of one Syrian family whose search for a better life in Europe turned to tragedy. And the passing of a pop icon. Thousands take to the streets in Iran to mourn the death of the singer Morteza Pashaye, whose death from cancer at the age of 30 has stunned the nation. First, the world has once again been shocked by the release of another grisly video by the Islamic State organization. Aid worker and Muslim convert Peter Kasig is the fifth Western hostage to be beheaded by the group. The 26-year-old was killed together with at least 18 Syrian military personnel, an act the US President Barack Obama called an act of pure evil. Well, amongst the militants shown in the video, a number of foreign fighters, including at least one Frenchman. 26-year-old American aid worker Peter Kasig was the fifth Westerner to be murdered by the Islamic State group in Syria. Among his killers was at least one French national, identified as Maxime Oshar, a Christian convert to radical Islam originally from Normandy. An increasing number of Western jihadists have figured prominently in the execution of Westerners. Where they previously covered their faces, they now show them. A defiant gesture towards the Western coalition showing the jihadists are unafraid of reprisals. All dressed in military uniform, they give the impression of a well-drilled army. What's interesting is that we see in this video the killers are of very different origins. We see Saudis, Yemenis, Asians and also Europeans. It's quite likely that at least one French national took part in this mass execution. The Islamic State group in this way has shown its international reach and its ability to strike. Before Peter Kasig, the American James Foley was the first Westerner to be killed by the group. A British national known as Jihadi John is believed to have carried out the killing. Pitting Westerners against one another in these killings seems to be a strategy for the Islamic State organization. It makes it all the more terrifying because while it might seem banal or common to Westerners to see an Iraqi or a Syrian cutting a Westerner's throat, it's not at all common to see a British national slit another Briton's throat or even to see a French jihadist being the captor of French hostages. By confronting a victim with a killer also from the West, the Islamic State group aims to amplify its message of terror across the territory under its control but also internationally. Now, at least four people have been killed and several others injured in Jerusalem in what police are describing as a terrorist attack. Two Palestinian men armed with a pistol, axes and meat cleavers carried out that attack at a synagogue in the west of the city during morning prayers. Well, this is the deadliest incident Jerusalem has seen in years and the Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, is vowing a tough response. France my cat's Nicholas Rushworth has more. This is the moment police moved in after two Palestinians stormed a synagogue in Jerusalem, attacking worshippers with knives, axes and guns. This is just not possible. People were here to pray and were murdered. People taking the train are killed. People taking the bus. A soldier was killed last week. This cannot happen. People are being killed in their country, town, place of prayer. The attack was at a synagogue in the Har Nof neighborhood, an ultra-Orthodox district of West Jerusalem. Police say it is an act of terrorism. The Israeli government has vowed to respond with a heavy hand. It blames Palestinian leaders for inciting violence. We will continue to provide maximum security for Jerusalem and its residents. The incitement is led by Mahmoud Abbas. The main responsibility is on him, on Hamas and on the northern Islamic faction. The Palestinian president Mahmoud Abbas condemned the killing of civilians no matter who was doing it. Hamas has called for continued revenge operations, saying this attack was a response to the death of a Palestinian bus driver found hanged in his vehicle. Hamas says he was murdered. Israel says the autopsy showed he committed suicide. 
The Italian Navy is once again being overwhelmed by the numbers of people making the dangerous crossing from North Africa to the waters off Sicily, with more than 2,000 migrants rescued during the course of the weekend alone. Well, of them, the majority originally came from Syria. But for so many families, this perilous journey across the Mediterranean has had a tragic outcome. France 24's Olivia salazar Winspear explains. It's the only time you'll see the flicker of a smile on their faces watching a home video of their four little girls. This Syrian family was living in Libya where the father worked as a doctor, yet their happiness wasn't to last. As the country descended into war, the family had to flee immediately, taking to the sea in an old trawler manned by human traffickers. Once on board, the couple were separated from their children. In the night of October 13, 2013, a number of boats were shipwrecked in the Mediterranean. This footage is from the Italian Coast Guard and shows vessels overflowing with passengers. At 4.30 p.m., the boat capsized in the middle of the ocean. People were thrown all over the place. When I lifted my head above the water, I could only see about three or four people. The waves were very high when we were separated. We couldn't see what was going on. They pulled me out of the sea about 6.30, around sunset. At that moment, I didn't know if my wife was alive or not. I didn't know what had happened to my four girls. I was screaming, completely crazy. I was calling for them, calling their names. On this rescue boat, Dr. Wahid is clearly visible. He's without his family. Later, while on a Maltese lifeboat, he bumped into a man he knew. He told me that he'd seen one of my daughters alive on a lifeboat. I thanked him and thought I was going to find everyone over the next few days. Dr. Wahid was taken to Malta along with hundreds of other refugees. His wife was taken to Italy. Both of them believed that the other one was with their daughters but the four girls had disappeared. Distraught and battling their grief, the couple still hold out hope. It's clear that I will find my daughters with God's help because they are alive, I'm hoping. Having sought refuge in Switzerland, now they try to carry on with their lives despite their loss. When I see these girls, I think of mine. Since the beginning of the year, more than 130,000 people have crossed the Mediterranean in makeshift vessels, and more than 2,500 have died in doing so. Now, with just a few days to go before their deadline, Iran and six world powers are sitting down for a final round of talks in Vienna. That's with the goal of curbing Tehran's nuclear ambitions. Well, if a deal is struck, it would help normalize relations between the Islamic Republic and the West and result in a significant improvement for the lives of ordinary Iranians. But U.S. officials are warning that despite months of negotiations, some major differences remain. And we end in Iran with the biggest street gathering since the 2009 protests which rocked the Islamic Republic. This time, though, the cause wasn't political. Rather, it was an outpouring of grief at one of the country's most loved pop stars, Morteza Pashaye, who died of cancer last week. He was 30 years old. France Cat's Claire Williams has more. Thousands of Iranians sing together. Everyone knows the words by heart, but they have nothing to do with religion. One Way Street is pop singer Morteza Pashayi's best known ballad. He sings of unrequited love. Iran's authorities deem his lyrics inappropriate. On Friday, the 30 year old died of stomach cancer. Tehran, Mashhad, Ispahan, Shiraz. His fans joined spontaneous memorials in the street across the country, catching the security forces off guard. 
Iran hasn't seen such large-scale gatherings since the Green Uprising in 2009. But these crowds aren't pushing a political message. Pashayi wasn't politically active, but he was too romantic for the Islamic Republic of Iran. Most of his songs were banned, and the authorities frequently cancelled his concerts. Treatment that's all too familiar for other Iranian artists seen as overly westernized. The authorities have been left bewildered by the public's display of affection for Pashai. His death has drawn bigger crowds than recent commemorations to mark 35 years since the U.S. Embassy takeover in Tehran, a major moment in Iran's 1979 revolution. A statement from the singer's parents may help the authorities save face. The Pashai family described their son as a religious follower of Iran's leaders, who may well wish to brush the whole episode under the carpet, just like this police officer, who saw fit to kick aside candles laid in the singer's memory. Well, that's it for this week's edition of Middle East Matters. Thanks for watching. See you again next week.